Our gospel reading this morning can be found in Luke 16, verses 1 through 13. He also said to the disciples, There was a rich man who bought a steward in charges, were bought to him, that this man was wasting his goods. And he called him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Turn in your account, turn in the account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be steward. And the steward said to himself, What shall I do? Since my master is taking the stewardship away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that people may receive me into their houses when I put out of stewardship. So surrounding his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measure of oil. And he sat down quickly and wrote, Write fifty. 
Then he said to another, uh, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write eight. The master commended the dishonest steward for his shrewdness, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous man, so that when it falls, they may receive you into the eternal habitation. He who is faithful in very little is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest in very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous man, who will be entrusted to you with true riches? And if you've been not faithful in which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. God's word for God's people. Praise be to God.
preacher, let the true servant come before and work through this piece of clay, this instrument. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, in the beginning part of his text, speaks about a shrewd businessman. But a businessman, nevertheless, who has wasted his masters, his managers' wealth. Jesus gives a perspective on what this shrewd person does in the midst to come back in favor in what he is good at doing and what he does dishonestly. And we find that this shrewd person goes to the land, but goes to the people in which is old. And he makes a deal with each one of those individuals, knowing that somehow, someway, he wants to get back in favor in what he does well and what he doesn't do well. And you find that he goes 50, 50, 50, and then brings it back to the manager who had fired him. And the manager says and compliments him on how he does that process. But he says one thing in the process. He said, your generation is a wicked generation who does not fully understand what you're doing. But those in life are not as sure. Then Jesus goes a little further down. And then he starts talking about wealth. He starts talking about, if I give you a little, if I give you a little, that test you out with a little, can I trust you with more? If I can't trust you with the little, then how can I trust you with the more? My brothers and sisters, Jesus reminds us at the end of this particular section, that you cannot serve God and money. You will love one or hate the other. Now, in the version that I just read a few minutes ago, it said man, talking about human beings. The greatest way in which we can serve one another and earn income is by serving, is by serving others. When we serve others, we gain income. The question is, by what means do we do it? In this text, Jesus is giving that perspective to remind us, if I give you a little, can I trust you with more later? Or if I give you a little and you're dishonest with it, with it will you be dishonest with much of what you're giving? You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. This is a hard concept. Because most people believe that those who are enslaved with money are rich people. But can I confess to you for a few moments in this text? Leaving Bethel Stabs and Brooklyn Austin Projects, the number one thing that I wanted to do was earn a lot of money. Because I believe that earning a lot of money would help others, help me, take care of the world. I would have the things that I saw on television. I would have the things that I saw on Park Avenue. I would see the things with children walking out of their houses in the limousines and going to school. It was something that I fantasized about. Coming from a household where my mother only made $9,000 a year, I thought that just wasn't enough. But yet I watched my mother with that $9,000 a year have Christmas gifts, keep food on the table, never walk to school with a hole in any of my clothes or my shoes. She knew how to take a little and make a lot. My brothers and sisters, I was sadly mistaken. There's something about when you have an encounter with God, when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, things change if you let it. I must apologize to you for a second. Many of my sermons in the 
pass out to say that Jesus spoke more about money than he did anything else. I stand corrected in my study this week. Of the 39 parables that Jesus spoke, only 11 he speak about money. He speaks about possessions. He speaks about goods. Jesus, and throughout the Bible, speaks more about do not be afraid and fear. In fact, in my study, it's quoted in the Bible 365 times. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. What should I not be afraid of? Should I not be afraid of death? Should I not be afraid of not having enough money? Should I not be afraid about going to hell because I'm not living right? Should I not be afraid because someone's going to harm me? Should I not be afraid that I'm not going to get into school? Should I not be afraid that I'm not going to be the person I'm going to love for the rest of my life? Should I not be afraid just because I'm not supposed to be afraid? There's a reason why Jesus spoke about this. Because Fear is the opposite of peace. And Jesus spoke about seeking the kingdom of God, and he talked about the context of money that helped us understand that what we're really seeking is peace in our life. That's why he came, that we might have peace, life, and more abundantly. And he wanted us, as we came to earth, to understand this journey of life, to not fear, but to hold on to God's unchanging hand. I gotta tell you, my brothers and sisters, I have pondered that question, that quote, you can't love God and money. I have sat back and watch how I have, I don't know about you, maybe you have, but how I have chased money in my life for more promotion, more status, more opportunities, even to say I've done it to help other people, to use the excuse that the more money I earn, the more I can help people. The sad part about that is I've come to realize on this journey that God wants you and I, most importantly, to have a personal relationship with him. Because it's in that personal relationship with God that you find peace and you're not afraid. Jesus keeps saying, peace be with you. He says that because he knows that it's in the peace of God that you learn how much he loves you. It's in the peace of God that you learn how much you love yourself. It's in the peace of God that you learn to love your fellow man. I realize that when I serve and love, the fear goes away and the peace comes into my life. The fear dissipates and I began to love and understand what joy, true joy is, even in the midst of my trials, tribulations, and sorrows. In my early stages of Christian, I used to hear my old church, our old pastor used to play a song by the old James called For the Love of Money. Now I gotta be honest with you, I was so heavy bound, but I was no earthly good, because I would say, how dare you play that second song in a church? But the truth be told, did you? The old days go look, they prophesied. Because they said, for the love of money, people will steal from their brother. For the love of money, people will rob. For the love of money, a young person will sell their precious body for a small piece of paper and holds a lot of weight for their need. It's not that money is the issue, it's the 
in my Father's house. This is what Jesus is saying. Look what David said. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you walk with me. We tend to say those two particular scriptures during funerals, but every day, my brothers and sisters, we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We face tribulations. We face disappointments. We face trials. We face all of that. Uncertainty. Who knows what another day will bring? But we face it. But this is the good news of the gospel. Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust in me that I got a place for you. And he's talking about peace. He's talking about the peace that stands within us. I have been most uneasy, uncertain in my life. And it's always been surrounded around money and possessions. Always. If, if I ask you what the biggest issue in your life right now, If any problem in your family, I can only guarantee you it's connected to a lack of communication and money. But God, Jesus says it. He says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. When David was pulling that scripture, David was in the midst of war. David wasn't dying. David was in the midst of war. He was fighting war. David was a warrior. When David wrote the 23rd Psalm, he was saying, I'm catching hell, and God, I need you to walk with me. You prepare us a place in the presence of my enemies. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David was saying, listen, I'm catching it. They're fighting me. I'm scared of God will me. He said, do not be afraid. Now, how am I going to conclude this? You start talking about money and God. I'm going to give you a story. The story of a man. Yeah, I thought my first grade this story, I said, this is just fiction. But this is the story. Here's a man who lives his life, chases money, never has enough, adds one bank account after the other, adds one bank account after the other, adds one account. He dies. He finds himself in the midst of mansions, jewels, women, money, parties, all that. Constant song, love, joy, no pain. But after a while, he gets tired. He's working. He's working. He says, God, why? Is this heaven? I, I wish I was in heaven. God said, what do you think you are? <laughs> you see, my brothers and sisters, we, the moral of that story, is the same story that follows in the bottom of the loop with Lazarus and the rich fool. See, the rich fool builds all these bonds and says, I'm going to build these bonds and live happy then the next day and night he dies. And when he dies, Lazarus, the poor man who was mistreated on earth, ignored by everybody, is sitting in the hands of Abraham. And the rich man just said, can I just dip my hand so I can just have a little pool? The moral of the story is this. All of us, when we face God one day, all of us as we face God today, the question is, what do we choose? Do we choose the life of love, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, love, gentleness, self-control to love one another, help one another? Or do we choose the fact that I'm going to get mine? You worry about getting yours. You poor because you want to be poor. You poor because you have not played this and you have not done this. This is what we hear. This is what we're teaching our children. And 
in the day, this is what we teach in colleges. Can, can I just conclude? I, I didn't retire from the university because I disliked my child. I retired from the university because it becomes, became big business. When people say that, they sit in the room and say, you know what, don't you touch me to the most important thing? I said, listen, if you don't pay that bill, you ain't going to be sitting in the right class. And I've had students as the dean that I watched who were great students who had to leave school. Not because they weren't smart, not because they didn't anything wrong, but because they just couldn't afford it. When those sort of money makes the world go round, yeah, it might make it go round, but you know what it's going to? It leave a lot of people to hell. On earth. And what I'm saying to y'all today, my brothers and sisters, congregation, the church, and all of us, and all that we're going through right now, in the midst of our sorrow and peace. Jesus gave us the answer. He said, serve God. For when you serve God and I serve God, there's a peace that rolls like a river. There's peace in knowing Peter, Mike, Becky, you want to see your loved ones one day. You just on this side to keep fighting. It hurts, but you gotta keep going. It's painful, but you gotta keep going. Because when you stay on that course with God, He'll come for you in the midnight hour. If you don't feel like getting up, something will come underneath you, the Holy Spirit, and lift you up and say, You gotta keep moving. Remember the memory. When you're sitting in there thinking about buying that next pair of shoes, God will send something across you and say, Now you know you don't need that pair of shoes, Charles. Go and donate two other pairs of shoes in your closet that you have not worn. See, my brothers and sisters, you hear what I was saying, I say it clearly. When people say it's better to be poor, that's a statement I've heard. And I'm going to tell you, I was quoted by a young lady asking, why are there so many poor people? Jesus said, you will always have a poor with you. Now, I'm not a prophet of God, but I said, there's so much poverty because there's so much greed. He says, what do you mean? I said, I just came back from Hawaii. I told him. I went by Shaq O'Neill's house. $30 million mansion on the water. And I was talking to one of the innkeepers, and I said, how often is Shaq here? You know what they told me? He said, Shaq goes to the house running once every five years. <laughs> now, I'm not criticizing what we're doing Shaq. That's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to tell you, though, is it's not, this is money. It's not, this is money. But everyone must want to be asked by God one day, what did you do with my name, Charles? What did you do with my name, Shaq? What did you do with my name, John Wesley? What did you do with my name, Brother Teresa? What did you do with my name? That's what Jesus is saying in this question. You see that shrewd businessman? Jesus was rebuking him. Because Jesus was saying, he's chasing money. But he can't take that money with him. And that's where we are. I, Reverend Rogers, Dean Rogers, Charles Rogers, whatever you want to call him, I've learned the hard way. That there's nothing more greater than serving God. There's no more greater than loving another human being. Because my brothers and sisters, your work is not here. Your work is when you walk out that door and they see the gospel of Jesus Christ on you. And they want a piece of that. See, drugs, pornography, any, any ill you can think of, good, bad, or different, is always connected to money. And not just money. The love of others. I want more money, but I don't want for sins of other people more. I got some young people who've come out of prison and nobody will hire them. So I have to find a way to start a business for them so they can take care of themselves. I have young children who've done nothing wrong in the world, but yet when they go to social services, they can't even get food stamps. You see, that's why I don't want more money. I don't want more money for a car. Cars go, I, I get bored with it. I don't have to car money for the whole thing bored with it. 
We need resources to do the kingdom of God. So I stand correct. Jesus didn't speak more about money. He spoke more about peace. And as I finish this sermon, Jesus wants all of us on this journey to live in peace with one another, bring others into the kingdom, and return to him in peace. That's what's most important. That's why he said 365 times in the word of God, all 66 books, do not be afraid. I wrote in that pulpit and proof. Why are you still here? Why are you still here? Why are you still here? Ask that question to yourself. Why are you still here? That, that's going to be my thing. As we move forward as a church, why are you still here? Why are you still here? I believe you're still here because God's not here with you. God has a plan for you, and God has a purpose for you. And why are you still on earth? He wants you to complete that plan and purpose. So when you see him, like our other brothers and sisters who have left us this last two months, we want to hear the words. Well done. Good and faithful servant. I trust you with a little bit. I trust you taking care of Peter and the kids and grandkids. And I trust you taking care of the cats. And I trust you with Ruth and I trust you with the cousins and stuff. Now, receive your reward. That's why you're still here. You're still here because God wants you to bring more people into the kingdom. Not Reverend Rogers. Y'all. You are a reflection of God's love. When you wake up in the morning, even when you don't feel like giving up, God loves you so much to say, hey, let's get going another day. Let's make it happen. And yeah, but I got aches and pains, and I got to go to the doctor. I got to take my pills. Take your pills and get going. That's why we are here. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. The Beatitudes. And Matthew as we come to Matthew 5, as we come to this song and number 401, the Beatitudes, the first Beatitude says, this is what Jesus says on the Sermon on the Mount as we sing this next song. He says, I just had this one. Oh, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Let us together sing hymn number 401.
The Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thou is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
We have it because yes. Thank you. 
serve two masters. For you will love the one and hate the other. Let us remember, let us serve God first. And whatever God gives us in manner and in common, that we use to his glory for his kingdom. And may the Lord say to Jesus Christ, be with you today. May he touch and keep you throughout the week. Smile at someone. Tell them hello. You might be making their day. In Jesus' name, amen.